Alright guys, we're going to pick up with the second part of our Slavery, Rising Tensions, and the U.S. Civil War Lecture Series. Uh, if you haven't already loaded it up, make sure you have pulled up your notes so you can follow along as we go. So, picking up with the birth of the Republican Party in 1854, uh, this is going to be the third time we have a renewed two-party system. Uh, with the first one being the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists then the uh, Democratic Republicans and the Whigs, and now we are going to have the Republicans and the Democrats. So, this new party is going to establish in 1854. It's going to be made up of the Northern Whigs, the Northern Democrats, the Free Soilers, the Know Nothings, and uh, pretty much anyone who disagreed with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. If you'll remember from the last lecture, that was the... Uh, popular sovereignty vote that led to the events of bleeding Kansas. Uh, parties are popping up and getting power pretty quick at this point. Uh, the Republican Party, it's being founded in 1854. In two years, by 1856, it's going to have a presidential candidate. It's not like the uh, modern Libertarian Party that's been trying to gain steam since uh, 1960. So let's move into the election of 1856. Uh, your Democratic nominee is going to be James Buchanan, while your Republicans are going to nominate one John C. Fremont. Uh, he's kind of an unknown factor. And then the American Party, this little third party, is going to nominate Millard Fillmore, who uh, is a failed president who would like to get elected again. If you remember, he was the VP for Zachary Taylor, who took over when Zachary Taylor died. Uh, now, uh, Buchanan's going to win. Uh, the Democrats at this point uh, are the largest party in the United States, and they're kind of tried and true. They are the reliable, reliable party. The Republicans don't have enough momentum yet to be a serious uh, contender. And if you look at the map, uh, you'll see James D. Buchanan, he wins with 174 electoral votes and 45% of the popular vote. Uh, Fremont is going to get 114. Uh, he mostly has those northern border states and New England. And then Millard Fillmore is going to get a whopping eight votes. So Democrats come out with a pretty clear victory here. Uh, Next thing that happens is going to be our next major Supreme Court case, and that's going to be the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford. So, here's the situation. Uh, the slave Dred Scott uh, and his owner, Sanford, uh, uh, originally they're from the South, from a slave state, and then they move up north into a free state. Dred Scott says, I should be free. Slavery is not not legal here. Uh, his owner says, "No, I'm not going to let you go." So Dred Scott sues. His logic being, slavery is not legal here, therefore I should be freed. Makes sense, doesn't it? I think it makes a lot of sense. So it's going to make its way up through the courts until it makes its way to the Supreme Court. Uh, it's going to be helmed by Justice Roger Taney on March 6th, 1857. And it's going to have a bit of a monumental ruling. He's going to rule that slaves are not citizens but property and therefore cannot sue in federal court. And it also rules that <coughs> the government cannot take your property away. That sets a bad precedent. That essentially said, uh, slave state, free state, doesn't matter anymore. If you're a slave, you, you, you stay a slave even if you cross state lines. So let's hop into 1858 and there's going to be this spectacle of an election 
in the Illinois Senate race. Uh, and it's called the Lincoln-Douglas Debates. It's going to be a series of debates between two prominent Illinois lawyers. So it's going to be between Lincoln and Douglas. Uh, the, these men have been lawyers in Illinois, uh, actually have been bitter rivals against each other as far as lawyers for many years. And they're both going to run for this Illinois State Senate seat. And in doing so, they're going to hold a series of debates across the state of Illinois, uh, bouncing from city to city and debating one another. Uh, and it, it becomes a spectacle. Uh, there are people who will follow the, these two candidates across the state just to continue to hear each of them speak. Uh, oddly enough, this ends up being a precursor for uh, the election of 1860. Douglas does end up winning this Senate race, but uh, it still puts a lot of uh, a, a lot of eyesight on. Lincoln as a powerful political party, and this is where he uh, is given his favorite quote, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Uh, around the same time, uh, another event happens. If you'll think back, you might remember the name of John Brown, Reverend John Brown. He was that crazy guy who led his cult to murder a bunch of people in Kansas and thought that God wanted him to free the slaves through any means necessary. Well, good old John Brown is having visions again. That's that's never a good sign. Never a good sign. Uh, and tells him he needs to get weapons so that he can lead an army of blacks to end all slavery. So what's what's he going to do? He and his cult, which includes his family, his wife, his kids, are going to go to Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Uh, it actually would be in modern day West Virginia, but West Virginia doesn't exist yet. And Harper's Ferry is the federal arsenal. It is where the, uh, the army keeps its guns. And John Brown is actually going to capture this arsenal. However, instead of taking his guns and leaving, he's waiting for an army of blacks to show up. Because that's what happened in his vision. Well, apparently no one else was watching the same vision channel in their crazy head. Because no army of blacks showed up. Who did show up? General Robert E. Lee in the U.S. Army who uh, recaptured Harper's Ferry. Uh, shots were fired, people were killed. John Brown himself survived long enough to be hung for treason. The thing about hanging John Brown is that actually made him a martyr. Now, if you don't know what a martyr is, a martyr is somebody who is thought to have died for a cause. And that was public perception. It was perceived that he was killed because he wanted to free the slaves. Not because he was an insane man who was having visions and killing people. Uh, some other examples of martyrs are people like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, people who, have, who, who were killed because they believed in a cause. Um... So, why was slavery such a big deal for us? Um, believe it or not, it actually nearly died out in the 1820s and the 1830s. It had become not profitable to own slaves. Uh, and and you, got, you, you find yourself asking, how could it be not profitable to own slaves? 
they're, they're, they're cheap labor, right? Yes, but the problem was, uh, not necessarily that picking cotton was labor intensive, but getting the seeds out of the cotton was extremely labor intensive. Uh, it, it, it took so long that it was not worth it. You would spend more money feeding and housing your slaves for the amount of time it took to get the seeds out of the cotton than you could sell the cotton for. That all changed when uh, Eli Whitney quote-unquote invented the cotton gin. So he didn't invent the cotton gin. The, the cotton gin had already been invented in the Caribbean. However, the North American cotton was a different type of cotton. It had a very slick, very oily seed that the uh, other cotton gin couldn't get out. So Eli Whitney adapted it and made the North American cotton gin, which would work. Uh, and that's that made it profitable again. It, it sped uh, deseeding cotton up by like 15 times. Now the other thing most people forget about King Cotton, as we call it, is the North was getting rich to, too. The South would, uh, would grow it, harvest it, bale it, but they didn't have the infrastructure to ship it out to the world. They would sell it to merchants in the North, and then those Northern merchants would sell it to the rest of the world. So the North was getting dirty rich too, off the backs of slavery. D don't think that the North was completely noble and out of this. No, they were getting their money too. Uh, but the South at this time was producing more than half of the world's cotton, which kind of gave them this attitude of we got something y'all need, so y'all gonna do what we want. And that was kind of what they thought when they went into the Civil War was they'll just bow down, the rest of the world will bow down to our whims because they need cotton. Didn't work out quite that way, but we'll get to that in probably the next lecture. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the cotton aristocracy and cotton society. <sighs> In 1850, only 1,733 families owned more than 100 slaves, but they controlled the entire southern manor system of government. So this is throughout the South. Only 1,700 families are in control. That's really a pretty small gap. Uh, the southern aristocrats uh, almost took deliberate steps to widen the gap between the wealthy and the poor. They really set up a system where you had to have money in order to make money, in order to have the opportunities to do things to make money, to get educated. If you weren't already a southern aristocrat, they made it harder and harder for you to become one. For example, private schools that were funded by the wealthy severely hampered public funded education. These, these rich folk were paying for their private schools and leaving the public schools just sitting there floundering. Still happens today. Uh, some other issues with the slave system were cotton production would spoil the earth. It would sap the uh, nutrients out of the soil to the point that nothing would grow. Um, of course, the other problem it had is it created a monopolistic economic structure. A monopolistic, it means it's singular. One crop. One source of income. All they had was cotton. So if anything happened to the cotton, their entire economic system would collapse. Um, the other thing is slaves are very valuable, but they're a heavy gamble. 
So, you would go out and you'd spend this <coughs> money on a slave. But, the slave could get sick and die. The slave could run away. The slave could develop an injury. You didn't know if you were going to get your money's worth on a slave. Uh, so, th th those were things that were considered. And the other thing is, this one crop economy left the South at the mercy of European markets. If the market decided that, uh, if Europe decided they had enough cotton, boom, the South was done. One more thing it did is it closed, the slave system kind of caused the Southern economy to be closed to immigrants. Why would they hire these immigrant workers when they've got slaves? So the uh, immigrant workers went to the North, where they uh, worked and ended up making the North wealthier. Um, want you want to stop and take a look at the uh, cultural layout of the South for a moment. <coughs> uh, of course, at the very top was your cottonocracy, your white aristocracy. Uh, beneath that were your uh, landed whites who only owned a few slaves. So those whites who weren't a part of that 1700 families, but still had some slaves. They weren't they weren't particularly bad off, but they didn't have nearly the power of cottonocracy. Then beneath the 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 landed whites were the slaveless whites. Which became known as white trash. That that they weren't they weren't the good whites. They weren't good enough. They uh, didn't have land. They didn't have money. They didn't have slaves. But they were still better than what they referred to as the mountain whites, or called crackers. Uh, the characteristics of the uh, the mountain whites were that. A, they hated the cottonocracy. They hated that top of the pyramid, uh, those rich plantation owners. But they also hated the blacks because uh, they felt that the blacks were, the black slaves were taking all the work that could be had. Uh, they were predominantly Scots-Irish. They were, they were descendants of early immigrants. And they just felt like they'd gotten the short end of the proverbial stick. There's one more group that's often forgotten about, and that is the free blacks. Uh, and, and these lived predominantly in the north, and they were usually men who were f whose parents or grandparents had been freed due to idealism in the American Revolution. If you'll remember, Washington promised freedom to any man who served, I think it was three years in the Continental Army. And some did that, and they got their freedoms that way. Your free blacks in the South were generally uh, a mulatto. That's it's a very disgusting term, honestly, but it was it was the term at the time for uh, people of mixed heritage, and, and that was pretty much how you became a free, only way to be a free black individual is if you were mixed. Uh, Many free blacks throughout the U.S. owned property. A few even owned slaves. In fact, one of the largest slave owners in the state of Texas was a black man. Uh, now, your northern blacks were especially hated by the Irish because they were seen as competition. Uh, the Irish are coming over here looking for jobs, and the jobs they want to get, they keep finding the black people working. And this begins this whole tradition of we're going to hate whoever has the job we want, no matter what color they are. We're going to find a way to hate them. Let's talk about slavery specifically on the plantation. Uh, importation of slaves was banned in 1808. However, we continued to smuggle nearly 4 million slaves in by 1860. We couldn't legally get them here, but that didn't mean they weren't coming. 
Of course, the majority of the slaves were in the deep south in the plantation regions. Uh, that doesn't surprise anybody. Now, we, or I say we, some underhanded things were done uh, on the plantation. Like, sometimes slave women were promised freedom if they had ten children. I'll think about that for a second. You need to bring ten children into this world. Damn them to a life of slavery that you are trying to escape by having children. It's a little messed up. Even more messed up is very seldom was that promise actually carried through. Because people lie. They just wanted to have they wanted them to have ten children because we couldn't legally import slaves. Therefore we've got to breed our own like livestock. Uh, so that you have slaver, slaves that you can send to the auction. Slave auctions are very brutal. If you've ever been to a livestock auction, it's much the same. Uh, only it's people. But they aren't considered people. They're property. It's uh, not necessarily a situation you like to think of running people through. Uh, it was so bad that one of the great authors of the time, who had been pro-slavery up until the time she uh, she saw a slave auction, uh, and we're talking about Harriet Beecher Stowe, who ended up writing Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was a, uh, a novel that was a discussion on slavery. Um, some of the burdens of bondage. Uh, th things that uh, were just effects that made life harder on slaves is, of course, they're generally illiterate. In fact, in most places, it was illegal to teach them how to read. Uh, however, they found ways around that. They, they had a strong oral tradition. They would teach uh, their heritage to each other through songs, hymns, and stories. But they'd also uh, find some ingenious ways to rebel without too much risk of punishment. They would, they were smart. Uh, they'd do things like break tools in such a way that they looked like they naturally broke. You can't work if the tools are broken. You can't get in trouble for not working hard enough if there's, you can't work. So the occasional uh, well-planned tool breaking gave them a break. Or they could slow, slow work down. See, what they did is while they were working the fields, they would sing. They would sing these hymns. And uh, if you've ever marched or watched anyone march, march you know that... <sighs> if there is a song or a rhythm going, you will naturally get to work, get to moving in that rhythm. And they knew that. And if they were, they felt generally well treated, they'd worked to some upbeat, upbeat hymns, get get some good speed going. However, if they were being run ragged and beaten, they switched to a slower song and start picking less. Other things they do is they would, uh, if the ones that worked up in the house would poison the food. Not to kill. Not to kill. That's suspicious. But if you, uh, poison it just enough to make the, make the, uh, white, the white lord and white lady of the house ill, you know who got to run the household while they was ill? The head slave. How much you want to think uh, life got better when the head slave was running things? Happened quite a bit. Uh, let's move on to the election of 1860. We're just about done for this lecture. It's running a little longer, but we'll get there. Uh, the uh, Republican Party in 1860 has had a lot of power grow. And their platform is going to be a non-extension of slavery, which is good for the free soilers, soilers, a protective tariff, which the northern industrialists love. They always love that. Uh, 
they're going to not abridge the rights for immigrants, which is a disappointment for the Know Nothing Party, but they're kind of a failing faction. That means they're not going to give immigrants special rights. Uh, the government is going to aid to build a Pacific Railroad for the Northwest. That They're going to help pay for building a railroad up into Oregon and Washington, which uh, those, those states liked. They'd spend a lot of money on on internal improvements for the West, which of course made these states in the West right, or made the states in the West happy. And they would open up public land for free homesteads for farmers. So they'd open up public land in the West for anyone who would plant a farm, they could get their, their first parcel of land for free. So it makes a very popular platform. So, the election of 1860 is going to have four people running. Abraham Lincoln runs as a Republican. His old friend, and by friend I mean bitter enemy, Stephen Douglas is going to run for the Democrats. Uh, John Bell is going to run as a part of the American Party. And then John C. Breckinridge is going to run as a Southern Democrat. See, the Democrats have split on the issue of slavery, much like the Whigs before them. And that's going to cause some issues. Uh, here's a picture of a, a political cartoon at the time. It shows these four candidates kind of tearing out their sections of the, uh, the, the country. <sighs> it was a very divisive election. So let's look at the map and see what actually happens. So you can see in the purple, Abraham Lincoln, he's actually going to win 180 electoral votes, which is enough to win. However, I'd like to point out that is only 39.8% of the popular vote. So he's going to win, but with less than 40% of people voting for him. Uh, you'll notice what states he did win. Uh, then you had the uh, Southern Democrat candidate, uh, John C. Breckinridge, who's going to win your Southern states and Maryland and Delaware <laughs> uh, with 72 votes, but only 18% of the popular vote. Uh, Stephen Douglas is only going to win two states. And he's uh, still going to get 12 electoral votes but a whopping 30% nearly of the popular vote. And then you've got John Bell, that American constitutional candidate, who's just going to win these three border states here, uh, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and get 39 electoral votes, but only 12% of the vote. This was very much an election about where you won. And you can see that, where... 10% of the popular vote difference between Douglas and Lincoln makes over a, makes a, nearly 160 votes of electoral vote difference. So that is uh, where we're going to leave off. You can already see the dividing lines that we're going to end up following along if you know where the Confederacy ends up sitting. Uh, anyway, we will pick up next week, uh, probably actually going into the Civil War itself. Uh, make sure you copied your notes meticulously. Remember, I count off for spelling errors since you are just copying it from my screen. Uh, Alright, have a good day.